Welcome back to Website and TV. I'm Gemma Houghton. Today I'm joined by AJ Hausman from Y Content to talk about content marketing in B2B. Hi AJ. Hi. Thank you for being here. Great to be here. So firstly, in general B2B marketing, what specific characteristics does that have compared to B2C? I don't think it's much different than B2C um, because you're definitely talking and, and marketing to people. Uh, but obviously uh, it's not an impulse buy if you buy something in B2B in, in generally or in general. So uh, it has a longer process. It has a more difficult uh, DMU, if you will, your decision making unit. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people need to uh, be aware of what the thing is that they're actually processing or buying. Um, but in general, I think uh, the whole distinction between B2B and B2C is uh, you're all actually going after uh, marketing to people, so I don't see that distinction. Being as great as maybe exactly. it's sometimes made out to Yes. Be. And then in terms of the type of content, if there's cases, of course, that you're just talking to people, mm. is the types of content and the, the methods in which you share information, again, the same, whether you, you're marketing a B2B or B2C product? Well, I think the type of content that you choose is the type of content that resonates best with your audience. And if that is, uh, well, we tended to do all kinds of white papers and long and winding stuff mm -hmm. uh, born from an IT perspective, I guess. But uh, you now see B2B doing a lot of th uh, stuff uh, also on, on video and on Periscope and what have you. I mean, you can use the same tools that you can use in B2C in B2B, and I think that B2B marketers are getting more creative every day. So Obviously, the content has to be compelling and relevant to what the person is interested in, what maybe they're looking to buy or, or use. So how do you make sure that the message is, is engaging but also relevant still and including that right information? Sure. Yeah, well, I always advise my clients to actually research their clients or pr prospective buyers. Mm -hmm. I mean... I'm, I'm astounded that uh, people are still sending out stuff without actually uh, looking at what people would like to receive. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's all in interruption mode, I guess, still. Um, and what you should do is actually ask your clients questions. What wakes them up at night or what keeps them up at night and what kind of content should you provide to uh, solve those problems? And if as long as you do that, then you're 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 fine. And possibly the format is less important if actually you're providing the right information. They're going yes, to be happy true. to receive that. True, true. And, and, and also that you can ask. I mean, some people like long form, some people like video, some people like events. And if you provide uh, what the people that you're uh, targeting are, are, are liking, then that is something that they will consume. And it's also important, I guess, then to, to make use of content and repurpose it. So you may create a white paper, but can you turn bits of that into a video or can you make it a webinar or a Obviously. blog post and yes, make the yes. most out of it so that everybody will find some way of consuming it? True. And, and that's also a very effective way of doing it because that's starting with the mindset of, of beginning with the end in mind, if you mm -hmm. will, and, and, and taking that big rock content and slicing it up into different pieces and, and having that uh, at the ready to... Uh, get that shelf life of your content uh, a little bit longer. And obviously for many businesses now, it's, they don't just focus uh, on their you know own home market, but they're looking internationally <coughs> and targeting a much wider audience. So what are the main challenges of and complexities, I guess, of, of content creation on a global scale? Well, there are a lot of complexities, obviously. I mean, there's language for one, there's culture, there's legal, obviously. <laughs> That's always a big part. I mean, you cannot do in, in some countries what you can do in other countries. And, and the cultural aspect is very important. I mean, if you work in Asia, it's much more indirect than you work uh, here in the U.S., or if you uh, use, uh, I mean, the devil is in the details, obviously. I mean, mm -hmm. you can use uh, uh, a piggy bank in, when you're working finance, fine here in the, in the U.S., but if you use that in a Muslim country, uh, you don't want to go there. So um, that, that, that's, that's, that, that has a lot of implications on working on a global scale. But what you must be aware of is the fact that uh, you have local teams on the ground in the regions that you work in and they should know best what resonates with their countries and their regions. So you have to have faith in the local team to make the decisions, as long as you agree on the general message that you want to convey to your targets. And what if you don't, you know, for some businesses, they, they end up <coughs> kind of expanding internationally maybe more quickly than they plan to. They're not a big global multinational business with teams everywhere. What options do they have to make sure that they don't make faux pas, but still make, you know, connections in different markets? 
Well, um, I, in, my, in my talk, I have a, an example of Philips, which is a global company, obviously, and have a lot of resources, uh, but uh, they uh, abide by what, what's called the Dutch standard, which means that they have found a country in the world, it happens to be my home country, <laughs> uh, where the legislation is stringent enough to work in most countries, uh, but not loose enough they can get into trouble. So that's why what they use, so I probably would advise people of expanding, of when expanding, uh, to uh, look at a standard that they can abide by that is uh, uh, not getting into trouble uh, fairly uh, soon, I guess. Uh, but it is difficult, I mean, uh, hooking up with local partners, maybe legal firms yeah. or something uh, like that, uh, will help you in uh, preventing getting into trouble. And once you've got an understanding of, you know, okay, what's acceptable, what's not, what's legal, what's not, in terms of actually creating that <coughs> content, you're getting it into the local language, making it, mm. you know, the right imagery, etc. Are there any tips you could offer for scaling that process? Because, of course, it is quite a challenging one. It is, yes. And, and it's always the eternal question to localize or not to localize, if you will. And if you work in some countries then English is fine I mean if you work in, in, in the Netherlands or in the Nordics then English is fine so yeah. you don't have to particularly translate and, and cultural wise it, it goes well as well but if you work in, in Germany or in France then you would rather yeah. much more translation uh, do much more translation uh, over 40% of people would not buy a product or service if the communication around that uh, was not in their own language so you need to be aware of that. And you mentioned about legal, um, you know, being aware of legal problems and making sure that you don't break reg reg restrictions. Are there any key ones that apply to, you know, <clears throat> b uh, certain sectors that really everyone should know about and that could cause major problems if you're not aware of? Well, obviously, the obvious one is, is privacy laws. They're, they're different around uh, the globe, and you have to be very aware of, of that. But I always say legal is... Um, looked upon as the, the, the sales prevention team, if you will, on, in most cases. Yeah. And, and legal should be your BFF. Yeah? You should be on the same page with legal all the time and work with each other instead of against each other. And what works great is, is, is getting into uh, meetings with them and seeing what, what helps legal and what legal could do to help marketing, to get on the same page and to get that message out without getting into too much trouble so that mutual understanding part is very important yeah which is the same i guess with all departments you know it's the same with the development department and the design department and all mm. areas it's a case of understanding the overall goals understanding the needs of every department and not trying to but you know working together not not balancing each other out no true and if you have strong leadership and if you have strong messaging and uh, a common goal and that's conveyed uh, across the globe uh, in every country, uh, then you're, uh, you're okay. Great. But that doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> no, nor is it that easy to achieve. That's true. It's uh, certainly something that every business wants to look to do, I guess. Yes, that's something to aspire to. Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank Same you for joining me. Thank you.